Hello, everybody, and welcome to our unit on stereotyping and prejudice. So I want us to consider the following set of facts. First, that men and women in the United States do not experience equal outcomes. First, let's consider the fact that women still make substantially less money than men. For every hour worked, 81 cents on the dollar. And you also see this represented in the fact that women are increasingly more in underrepresented the farther that you travel up the corporate hierarchy. So when you look at entry-level positions, men and women are basically at parity, but the divide starts to grow as you move to manager, senior manager. By the time you're talking about vice president, there are twice as many men in these roles as women. And by the time you're looking at um, chief executive level, CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, and so on, you have 80% men and only 21% women represented. And this isn't just about the workplace. You also see these gendered discrepancies in domestic life where women do about twice as much domestic labor when measured in hours. This spans from doing more than twice as much food preparation, more than twice as much, almost all in fact, of the laundry and clothes care, um, and more than twice as much child care. And the extra amount that men seem to do in terms of outdoors work or around the house maintenance does not make up for this increased labor in terms of total number of hours. And we also know that white Americans and Americans of color absolutely do not experience equal outcomes. You see this in domains of life that you might expect should have nothing to do with race, like medical care, where black mothers are tragically about four times as likely to die during childbirth compared to white mothers. You can see that the orange line here represents African American mothers and their rate of death per 100,000 live births is currently, it's actually rising, about 38. Whereas for white women, it's about 11, and for women who are neither black nor white, it's about 15. For black and Hispanic men, they're much more likely to be incarcerated across the course of their lifetime. So for black men in particular, about a 32% likelihood across the lifetime compared to 11% for all men of all races pooled together. And you also see this in the economic domain, which I think we are, we're all aware of. Um, and these gaps are not closing, right? These gaps are, if anything, even increasing. So at current, um, Asian Americans make about $81,000 per year, white Americans on average 68 compared to 50,000 for Hispanic Americans and 40,000 for Black Americans. And all of this despite the fact that very few people in the modern United States would openly admit to being racist or sexist. These sorts of bigotry are very much disapproved of. And yet these societal discrepancies not only persist, but if anything, even increase over time. So you might be wondering, do these discrepancies necessarily point to the presence of racism, prejudice, other kinds of isms? You might wonder whether this is simply a very long historical legacy of prior discrimination or prior differences in status that persist despite the fact that maybe nowadays people really aren't racist or sexist. Maybe you think there might be confounding factors that lead to these discrepancies. Well, I want us to consider at least one domain where we know these discrepancies exist, which is employment and income. And for this, we're going to consider Jose Zamora's experience. I think you'll find his story really interesting. My name's Jose Zamora, and I had to drop a letter to get the title. Every morning I wake up, go on Craigslist, and apply to as many jobs, every job I can, that I feel qualified for about 50 to 100 a day for months. No phone calls, no, no emails, nothing. One day I just thought, what if I try Joe? Just remove the S in my name and maybe I can make some dollar signs. The Monday I decided to go from Jose to Joe, seven days later, the next Monday, that's when all the responses started coming. That's when all the replies and the emails. The position is open, we wanna meet with you. Um, call us back. I was applying for the same exact jobs the exact same resume, the exact same experience, just a different name. 
Sometimes I don't even think people know or conscious or aware that they're judging, even if it's by a name, but I think we all do it all the time. And what we just saw in this video is not just fascinating and alarming from a personal or anecdotal perspective. It also happens to track quite closely with what we actually do in social science to assess discrimination in the employment domain. And this is what I'm going to call the job applicant paradigm. So the job applicant paradigm involves taking a resume um, that's totally identical, except for a couple of key personal identifying factors. And these might be things like someone's name, or a photo that's attached to the CV, or maybe a couple of descriptions of the person's interests or extracurriculars or organizational affiliations that might clue you in to their gender or sexuality or racial identification. So in this case, for instance, we would be taking the same pretty standard resume um, and we would just change the photo so that it cued a white woman versus a black woman. And it turns out that this is a really great way to isolate that variable of racial identification with everything else held constant. You can hold constant how qualified somebody is, the kind of education that they have, the kind of skills that they have. And it turns out that when you do research with this paradigm, you see exactly what Jose Zamora experienced. Whites, rather than people who have cues indicating that they are people of color, whether it's a name or a photo, tend to get a lot more callbacks. We're looking at the data from one particular study. This is not the only study that's looked at this, but this is Bertrand and Melanathan in 2004. And they not only varied whether or not the resumes had white names versus kind of typically African-American names, they specifically use things like Emily and Greg versus Lakeisha and Tyrone. And what they found, these very, very stereotypical names, right? And what they found is that even when a white name was attached to a resume that represented pretty low qualifications, that resume still got more callbacks than a resume with a stereotypically African-American name that represented a really high level of qualifications. Now, you might be thinking, okay, 2004, that's ages ago, surely things have gotten better. Well, I'm really sorry to say that they have not. So I'm going to present you some data. It's going to look a little complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to present you with some data from a meta-analysis that looked at every time this job applicant paradigm has been used from 1975 all the way to through 2015. Now, what we're looking at here is every study, and each study is one of those gray circles. So it's plotted both by the year in which it was carried out, and also the ratio of callbacks of the white resumes versus the black resumes. So the um, blue dotted line would represent a one-to-one -one ratio. That would be a quality. That would be an even amount of callbacks, no matter the race signaled by your resume. The higher up one of those gray dots is, the more discrimination we're seeing. That means that a greater proportion of white res resumes received callbacks relative to the African-American resumes. And then that dotted and solid black lines are both ways of representing this trend over time. And even though it looks like it's going up a little bit, that would actually represent an increase in discrimination rather than a de decrease. It's not statistically significant, so really what this means is the level of discrimination isn't changing. And when you average across the entire sample, across all of these years, white applicants received 36% more callbacks than black applicants. And I want you to note that this was ultimately a very large sample because they were collapsing across a lot of different studies. And so this involved tens of thousands of resumes that were mailed out. These are some pretty reliable results. When you're comparing white applicants to Hispanic applicants, you see an almost as distressing pattern where um, actually in this case, the level of discrimination is sloping downwards a little bit over time. We are slowly uh, moving towards equality, but still, Pooling across all of these samples, white applicants received a full 24% more callbacks than Latino or Latina applicants. This should be very distressing. So 
I take this as pretty strong evidence that not only do we see these broad societal discrepancies, but at least part of these discrepancies can be traced back to the decisions that people are still making that bias them against people of color and against women, and of course against other marginalized groups in our society. LGBTQ folks, people with disabilities, the elderly, and so on. Now, bias isn't just one thing. When we're talking about the processes, the psychological processes that lead to these terrible, terrible outcomes, there's actually kind of a complex stew of stuff that's going on. And it involves these three layers. You've got stereotypes, which are the more cognitive component of bias. You've got prejudices, which are the more felt or affective components of bias. And then you've got actual discrimination, which refers to the actual behaviors or actions people take. Now to break this down a little bit further, stereotypes are generalized beliefs about what members of a group are like. So it's not just any kind of cognition about a group. It's a cognition where you're assuming that different members of a group are similar to one another, and so you're generalizing an assumption. This might be like thinking about people who are overweight and making the assumption that these people are lazy or physically inactive. Prejudices refer to more of the emotional component of how you feel towards a group. Your general attitude, now remember when we talked about attitudes and remember how it had this more positive versus negative component to it, it's the same here. So in other words, how do you generally feel about members of this group? And again, if we're talking about people of size, people who are overweight, there may be a connection between your stereotype and your prejudice. The more that you believe that people are overweight because they don't have self-control or because they're not physically active, the more you might feel negative emotions or kind of disparagement towards this group. And then these are both separate from discrimination, which is specifically behaving differently towards somebody because they are a member of a group. And so in this case, let's say you have a stereotype about people who are overweight. Let's say that stereotype has also bled in to negative feelings towards people who are heavier. You could or could not actually discriminate against members of this group. So in many cases, feeling negatively might actually change your behavior in subtle ways, right? If you're choosing who to sit next to on a bus, you might sit farther away from someone who's overweight. But maybe you also are aware of your feelings, you know that's not appropriate behavior, and so you keep these stereotypes and prejudices private, which might mean that you don't actually behaviorally discriminate. So these things are interconnected, but they're not necessarily all the same.